Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Get Into It with Gila. I'm your host, Gila Glassberg, and today I have Gelly Asofsky. Hi, Gelly. How are you? Hi, how are you? So happy to be here. So happy to have you on. I know it took a few weeks to get you on and a few um, days where my kids were home from school and then, you know, whatever. Blah, blah, Hashem. Here you are. We're here. And you know what? I always say parenting comes first. So good yeah. for you for putting your kids first. I really uh, appreciated the flexibility because I was like, should I try to make it work? He's not going to be happy if I'm on the phone. I'll probably come in and be on the podcast, which has happened before. But whatever, we made it work. Bar Hashem. Yeah. Um, okay. So I just want to say this to the listeners. I follow you on Instagram, Parenting with Gelly, and I, I love your account. But what, what drew me to you really to interview you was your episode on, on the Joma podcast. Um, I've also been interviewed on that podcast, actually. And I, I had a long drive to Cleveland or Rochester, one of the two. I had two back-to-back long drives. And I was listening to podcast after podcast. And you you know, I was up late at night driving. Yours was like really kept me up. It was such an interesting episode. Thank you. So you never knows where people yeah. get to know you from. Yeah. Yes. And actually, you know, I I've recently been realizing how different people are, how different it is to absorb content from Instagram versus podcast, because I am on Instagram and I also have a podcast. And it's a totally different vibe. <laughs> Yeah. Just so you know, yeah. and just so people who are listening know, like some people really do like to watch people and some people really do like to listen, especially if you're driving, you can't watch anything. So it's like, you're just like gaining all this insight as you're driving. You know what I mean? So anyways, could you tell the listeners um, a little bit about yourself? What, where do you live? What do you do? Talk to me. Sure. Okay. So first and foremost, I'm a mother. I always say that's my claim to fame being a mother. And now I'm a grandmother of two little kids, Mm. cutie pies, Mayer and Layla. And Mm. uh, they make my life very, very special. Mm. And professionally, I'm a child and family therapist in Muncie, New York, uh, for the past 20 years, mostly working within the from community sector, um, whether it's Orthodox, Heimish, Hasidish. I speak a fluent Yiddish. So I land up speaking, seeing a lot of children who only speak Yiddish as a primary language. And uh, I also am a registered play therapy supervisor and an EMDR consultant. So mm-hmm. I, I guess at this point in my life, I do a uh, supervision. So I supervise therapists in implementing uh, whether it's play therapy or EMDR into their practice. And it's added a completely different dimension to the work that I do. I'm also the coordinator of our local trauma recovery network where EMDR therapists are available in times of community crisis, natural disasters, hate crimes, terrorism to provide pro bono EMDR therapy. So um, that was started after the Rabbi Rottenberg knife attack. Um, mm. and we're trying to get ourselves mobilized. Khalila, Khalila, there are crazy stories that we can be available to serve the community. And I also have my uh, parenting courses and the one offline is a telecourse, which wow. is so interesting because I started with the from community as a telecourse mm-hmm. um, because I heard that that's what people like. Um, it's called play for those- thing. Playful and parenting. Is that for, for those who don't use the internet or that's just because it's more convenient? It's, I would say I did it for people who don't use the internet, but I am finding that a lot of people who are online and are in social media value it because like you said, you're driving, you're doing laundry or whatever you're doing, you just have the phone and you're listening. Mm-hmm. So um, that's an eight week program. I absolutely love that. And then we finish beta testing it online. And that's more of a, a video program with a Facebook group, more for people who like and open to the, from people and the greater community. So um, I, I guess that's a big mouthful, but. That's a lot of <laughs> things. You do a lot of things. What I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do a lot of important work. Wow. That's really incredible. Um, it gives me hope for like, for like, when I could say like, I've been doing something for 20 years, like that I'll be able to do all the things that I want to do, you know, because now it's <laughs> hard to 
and do all those things. Raising kids comes first. And I always say that Mm -hmm. the priority has to be your kids. And what I am today is not what I was five years ago or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 20 years ago. Right. Um, You know, I look a lot younger than I am, but when I say I'm a grandmother, people do the math. So yeah. I'm almost yeah. years old, you know? So at that point, it's, you know, these things accumulate. And if you have right. a vision, yeah. then you yes. map it out and do it. <laughs> I've been told that many times, like, you know, in 10 years, your life will look different. So you could, you could dream, you could dream big for those 10 years. Yes. Yeah. So how did, did you always know you wanted to be a therapist? Like, how did that come to be? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great starting question. So I, I guess I grew up sheltered in Muncie. You know, there was you're no born and bred, that. born and bred yes. in Muncie. Oh, born, wow. bred, wed. <laughs> wow. Okay, yeah. so you've always lived in Muncie. Yeah. No internet. No city life. It was just my nice little countryside, and it doesn't look the way it used to. And I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, what does every girl want to be, right? Before there were options, I I just wanted to be a teacher. (laughs) So when I got older, you know, jobs were hard to come by and I tutored Russian girls. Mm. Um, So they didn't know any English. I didn't know any Russian. And I was, that was interesting. And it was my first challenge. Um, And then I got married, I worked as, before I got married, I worked as a high school teacher for three months. Um, It was, I was not prepared for that. (laughs) It sounds really hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I was very like um, aspirational, but with no skills, right? right? And then class after class of teenagers, some were good, some were challenging. Yeah. Um, and then my mother nearly died with placenta previa. So wow. I stopped working. I took care of her. I took care of our family. Wow. I took care of the baby. Oh um, my. We delayed our engagement and uh, we got married, multiple jobs. Long story short, my husband was working with teenagers that didn't fit into the school system, mm. teenage boys. And one day he came home, he said, this one is, you know, really struggling with their mental health. Can't find a therapist who speaks Yiddish. They were Hasidic kids. We have to go to um, non-Jewish, secular, modern Orthodox. And nothing's wrong with getting help from someone qualified. I just want to say that. Right. These, these teenagers had a real a language barrier and their parents were uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. sending them to the therapist there was nobody out there so he's like why don't you go to school and become a therapist so that's wow. what happened actually uh is that so well with you when he said that yeah you- I mean I you know like I said I was never I'm a bright person I have a lot of interests but I never thought about college it wasn't mm-hmm. It wasn't something in my Heimish Hasidish world that people did. And mm-hmm. I thought to myself, okay, well, how do I do this? So I mm-hmm. went and got my bachelor's in um, <clears throat> through Empire State College, did a really advanced, quick, blasted through it curriculum wow. uh, with a one-on-one mentor. And then I looked at the top two schools for social work. And I tried to figure out, do I want to become a psychologist? Do I want to become a social worker? And the calculation that I made was that a psychologist, like I would love to be a doctor, but it would Mm -hmm. take five years. My kids were young. Right. They were two and five. And to become a social worker would be two years. And I would always study that that I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. So I decided to become a social worker. Wow. And um, then I went to NYU. That's that wow. was that point, one of the top two social workers. <clears throat> and um, here I am 20 years later, but I started as a, as a real giving to the community. That, that was the beginning. And it, it was hard in the beginning because mental health was a real stereotype back then. And so I landed up seeing lots of Haitian kids, lots of different Wow. And then that was okay too. Everybody, uh, uh, as a therapist, you, you don't discriminate, right? Right. The reason that I went in 
to the field was to help the community and to bring the best of science, the best of therapy, the best healing modalities to the from community. And I can honestly say, like, I've accomplished that goal and I keep, I keep working on it. Wow. So that, that was 20 years ago when you got your degree? Uh, I started school in uh, 2000. Yeah. So wow. that was when I started my internship. Yep. And we're in 2022. I graduated in 2002. Yep. Wow. So did, in your head, you were thinking like, I'm going to start like doing private practice and help the firm community or, or did you have to like work under somebody for a while or are you able to just start you can't right away? just walk into private practice. I mean, people do it, but the legality piece is you just talked about having children. I worked about 12 to 15 hours a week. I was a full-time mommy. Right. And um, it wasn't easy. And it took I understand. Me, right? It took yeah. Me, usually they say that, well, the rules have changed. But when I was in school, if you work 20 hours a week, and three years and under supervision, then you could qualify to take the state licensing board, mm -hmm. but you had to add up the math. So you could either do 20 hours, 15 hours or 10 hours. So I had to pick the longest route because it had to add up, it had to be signed off. So it took me six years to qualify wow. for that exam, which meant I couldn't work privately because mm -hmm illegally i had to have the lcsw and then you if you work another three years under supervision you qualify for the lcswr so um that that's the designation i wanted so i worked 18 years part-time in a clinic and mm. then i divided that between working the last 10 years in private practice until i was competing against myself Right. And then right. I, I left and I went into full time private practice. Wow. Yeah. I know like a tiny bit about it because I have a good friend who is doing this now and she's trying to get her. Her L. Does that make sense? And she did a lot of hours super, of supervision and yeah. she wants to do private practice. So, yeah, as a dietitian, I also went into private practice and it's been challenging and I pay my own supervisor because we don't technically have to do that, but it's like really hard not to do that. Their cases are so challenging. If you're doing eating disorders, disordered eating, it's, it's yeah. challenging. Yeah. And I always say to people, like I paid for my own supervision when I had a supervisor in the clinic, mm -hmm. right? I wanted to become a registered play therapy supervisor. I wanted to be trained in by experts. When right. I wanted to become an EMDR expert, I wanted to get supervision from the top child EMDR therapist in right. the country, right? Wow. Yeah. I, I wanted that level of expertise. So, right. you know, it doesn't happen out of nowhere. It's the supervision, right. it's the training, it's the right. education. The commitment. The yeah. 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 Years and years of working and seeing so many different things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm still, I'm still very new to the field, I would say, just because um I've been doing it now for five years you know but like you can't put a price tag on experience really um yeah. so but you mentioned play therapy so where did that come in I think the kids found me mm -hmm. <laughs> so in the clinic I was assigned a variety of clients and I had always said look my kids are young I want to I don't want to work all day with kids and then come home Right. And then be bored when I when my kids come home. Right. But then I got I kept getting assigned children. So I started taking trainings on um, you know, how to help kids. And then it just developed one thing after another. People started telling their friends. And all of a sudden my practice was a hundred percent kids. It's like a calling. It's like a calling, yeah. right? I've yeah. seen you talk about it on Instagram like that. You're you're yeah. very playful and like yeah. And, and you love kids. And, and that's sort of just like your natural calling that you. Yes. Like, right? Yeah. Yeah. But Did when you know I was that? young, I wanted to do this, you know, intellectual, whatever, you know. <laughs> it was, very funny. That's yeah. very funny. Yeah. Like I've, I've, oh, it, it, this is funny. I'll just say this. Like I'm one of nine. I'm the fourth of nine. And my mom always joked that like, I hated it. And that like, I was very materialistic as a kid. And like, mm -hmm. I wanted my own room. It was hard for me as a kid. And, um, 
And I always ended up, you know, like I had to work my whole life. I worked in camps and I was always very good with kids, but I didn't like love working with kids. But it is funny that like there's su- it's such a skill to work with kids. It's a, it's you either like kind of have it or you don't. You could definitely cultivate it. But like I've always been told like, yeah, you're so good with kids. I'm like, really? That's so funny because I'm I also like love to work with adults and like it, the intellectual side of things. But there's a real skill as an adult to be be able to. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know. And I would say that that's one of the things that was my goal in creating the course, which by the way, the course that I was gonna create that was in my head for when my kids get older was a more academic adult course, you know, to help adults. Right. And then during my near death with COVID 19 months ago, I made this promise to myself saying that if I survive, I would create a parenting course to help mothers and that's how this course evolved because it is something that can be taught. Wow. Like I, you can, I can break it down to you so practically. That's my middle name, practical, that you literally don't have to think about it. You could just do it and you'll see the results, which wow. is interesting, but it is, it's something that could be cultivated. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I've, I've had this conversation with my own therapist many times where she's like, you're just not that type of mom that wants to sit on the floor and play with your kids. And you're probably like, that's probably the majority of moms. I'm like, oh, th- that can't be true. You know, like I kept saying, that can't be true. She's like, no, it is true. And like, you know, like, obviously I love yeah. my kids. I love being with my kids, but you sometimes have to get creative if that's not like sitting on the floor and playing with blocks is not yeah. like your nature. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I know that's not the focus of our talk, but yeah. if you want to talk to me afterwards, uh, thank you. I am literally, that's my mission statement to revolutionize the world of parenting. Don't think of play as sitting on the floor and playing with your kids blocks. Right. Playing is being a playful mother, bringing the things that make you happy into your life. And also, if you have two minutes, you have five minutes, you have 10 minutes, that's the foundation of what I teach, you can play. Right. It doesn't mean it's something to be saved up for. Because right. that's the that, number yeah. one question that parents go and they're like, oh my God, I feel like I am literally going to go under the to-do list. It's right. so big and I have to just sit there and yes, my eyelids so are shut on me. Yeah. And like, if my kid offers me make-believe coffee one more time. <laughs> right? Yes, that's my, that's my afternoons right now. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very funny. It's actually funny because since that conversation with my therapist, my so I have a daughter who's just not turning nine and then a six-year-old mm-hmm. son and a three-year-old son. And we're in a new stage now where like my boys are really close and they're really playing. They're like, they don't need us, you know, they're just like right. so in the zone of play. And that we've never had that because um, my, you know, they say like oldest don't do that. My daughter definitely didn't. And, and my son, my six-year-old is always so bored. But now that my three-year-old like getting with the program, you know, it's like really cute to see. So I see how like I do, I I do matter. Like they still want to show me, they still want to explain it to me, but like, it's so much easier. It's so much easier for me. Like that I'm, I'm sort of like there watching versus like, okay, guys, who wants to do magnetiles now? Like, okay, 10 minutes later now, you know? Right. Um, Right. right, But I, that is, I I heard you say that if anyone wants to hear your story on the Joma podcast, I could link that in the show notes um, about your near death experience. But so you, so you sort of had like um, a change of heart during that time where you were like, this is what the world needs. It wasn't even a change of heart. I think I was semi-conscious when I made that decision. I mean, all the systems failed and in retrospect, like so many people who I spoke to after I finally, because after the near death semi-conscious crazies, I couldn't even talk, right? Wow. There was a very long recovery with my lungs wow. um, and COVID, long haul of symptoms and all of that. But people re- reminded me that when I could barely croak out a sentence, I would say, so here's what I'm going to do if I survive. Here's what I'm thinking about. And they'd be sitting davening and saying, till I'm hoping I make it. And I was talking about, okay, so this and this is what I see in my therapy office. So now it makes sense. And I would say a little tidbit to this one, a little tidbit to that one. And, and then I actually signed up for a course on how to create a course. 
and I would just keep it playing all day long and I fall asleep. I click it on again and here I am. It's, it's unbelievable. Anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm impressed. Like I'm just shocked at how resiliency works and that's yes. a whole other topic. Yeah. But I was resilient. And even though I knew there was a real possibility, I may not make it at times. Most times I focused on what I could give back wow. and um, it kept me alive. I think. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does sound that like there was some like supernatural for this course, right? Yeah. 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 Like you just had to, you had to, I mean, you had to survive for many reasons, but you had to survive to like get this course out into the world yeah. and ha how's the feedback about the course? It's, a, it's amazing. Like I've walked hundreds of women through the telecourse um, and now I'm actually launching a Yiddish version of it. Wow. Uh, that's, that's been on my mind actually for half a year. I just wasn't well enough to actually bring it to fruition. Right. Um, but now it's happening and I've been beta testing the online version for six months. Wow. And um, it's amazing. It's just like, the feedback I've gotten is once you get midpoint, it doesn't matter if you take four months to get there, if you take four weeks to get there, however you do the course, by the time you're midway through the program, you've changed your mindset and your household and your relationship with your children. So it's, it's really motivating me to keep creating, I guess. That's amazing, so, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll link all that information in the show notes so people can, can sign up for the course. Yeah, let's yeah. get this into the world. Yeah. I, I know my parenting, have been, I don't want to talk so much about my parenting, but I know my parenting has been revolutionized with the parenting classes that I took Para Lebron with his course and Simma Spetner's course. And yeah, yeah. it's been yeah. really amazing to have that mind mindset shift when it comes to parenting. The things that like didn't make sense as a kid and now aren't making so much sense as an adult and you're trying to, you know, fix that. It's really interesting. Yeah. So I wanted to um, bring you on to talk a little bit about um, things that you see in your practice in terms of like, if children are struggling with feeling uncomfortable in their body, body image things, and maybe not so much the children, but the parents, like, what, what do you see in your practice? Sure. Um, and, and I'm just telling everyone, we decided to do this as a natural flow, because these conversations, I, I think they go so nicely when it's just you know, of course, I prepared a little in my mind, but I don't have like a, a paper that I'm reading off of. So I think one of the biggest things that I see is that children don't really think they're overweight. Most of the time, children aren't born with that kind of like, oh, I'm fat. Mm -hmm. It happens when they get a little older, when kids start making comments kids start becoming more aware, but that's all the where they learn that from is when their parents focus on the weight. Mm -hmm. Don't take that extra cookie. And I'm not saying that that kid should have the extra cookie, but it starts with the rules are different for you because, you know, you need to fit into your clothes. Mm -hmm. You don't realize you're telling a little kid they need to fit into their clothes. Right. Right. Or mommy's on a diet. We're all sitting and eating pizza, but mommy is not eating pizza. Mommy's on a diet. Okay. Um, a kid sitting in my practice and we're celebrating a great job done with therapy. And I always like to have, like, they can bring in their favorite nosh one after another. Mommy's not eating. She's on a diet. And the occasional mother will bring a diet muffin or a diet drink. And I'm sitting there and it's like, Ellie, just stay in your lane. Therapy right. is over. There's nothing right. you can tell this mother. You're never going to meet them again in your life. Right. And how did I not see this? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not that the mother is bad. It's just we're conditioned as human beings, as females, I would say that thin is better. So there's two pieces to this. There's one, the messages that we're giving. The other thing is that your child's sense of themselves should not be about their physical being. It's about what they're good at, what they're, they're helping, their kindness, their ability to draw, their, you know, their talent at sports. Mm -hmm. That's what's important, not what they're 
physical body is. And I mean, you may be looking at me and saying, well, you're not thin. So like, great, you're talking like that. When I was, before I was 10 years old, I was super, super, super thin. And that probably was my physiology. When I was 10 years old, I had what was called osteomonolitis. And there was an infection that traveled through my body and started eating my ankle bone. Oh, wow. So from one week to the next, and this was before MRIs or CAT scans. So the technology, this is going back almost 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, after two weeks of going from doctor to doctor, I remember a tiny screen where they saw the blood going slower in one foot than the other. And they had to do a biopsy immediately to find out why I had stopped walking. And what they found out is there was an infection. I had to be on IV around the clock. I was in the hospital for five weeks. Mm. Now, now this outpatient. Uh -huh. So you can imagine being a, being a precocious 10-year-old. I ate meal mark, kosher food, breakfast, lunch, and supper. My parents bought me dinner, right? Um, everyone that came bought me pizza bells. That was a big one. They don't make it nowadays. Um, the junk that I ate, I was hooked up to IV and I read all day, didn't move and ate about seven meals a day. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was what I did. Right. Okay. So when I came out of the hospital, I was probably, my physiology was permanently changed. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say permanently, but right. my parents didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they didn't put that on me. My clothes were bursting out of me and I never went back to being a thin kid. So mm -hmm. yeah, there, there were times when I mourned that, not at that age, but being 16, 17, even, even 15 years ago, I was like, you know, let's do some hypnosis about getting into that thin 10 year old, that mm -hmm. physiology, that, that perfect body, right? But luckily my parents didn't, say anything they didn't create an eating disorder out of it right totally it's interesting because yeah. we in the intuitive eating health at every size space we don't even I don't know how you feel about this but we don't even um like call that type of food junk food because it's like a label on food it like implies yeah. that it should yeah. you know junk garbage implies that it should yeah. be in the garbage so like even with my own like supervisor who I'm working with like we don't really um, label any food, like he even healthy or unhealthy, which seems so innocent, but all foods could really fit, you know? So like you said, if you're celebrating with um, one of your children in, in therapy, one of your clients, um, and you're using food to celebrate, obviously that has its place. Otherwise you wouldn't do it, you know? So right. the, the right. messaging is like, uh, you know, th this is junk food, but I'm giving it to you. It's it's not a good message. So, right. um, but, but that's really interesting. Like, and, and also like we were talking about it a little bit before we started recording, like, um, that like, like you had this near death experience and that's really like a huge challenge. And at the same time, you're so grateful that now you're alive. So like a lot of what the intuitive eating, like help at every size people were saying on, on Instagram was like, after COVID, if you gained, if you gained some weight, like, and that was the worst thing that happened to you, like consider yourself lucky, meaning like you went through this trauma at age 10, where like, you, like you didn't know what was wrong with you. They figured it out. You had to be hooked up to IV for five weeks. And that was probably terrible. Um, and at the same time, you were, you know, people were trying to help you and give you food and help you be comfortable. And um, a result was gaining weight, but it wasn't like, thank God, it wasn't like blown out of proportion that, that, oh, now she gains weight. Like, what are we going to do about it? It was just, yeah, the, no, it just was, the facts. It wasn't even addressed. It right. was like, you know, right. well, when we went shopping for the full clothes, we got the size that I fit into. Right. And I don't remember feeling like anything like no one looked at me and said, hmm, hmm. no, it's just right. like, okay, I don't know. Bodies change. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. whatever. Yeah. So does it happen in your practice though, that like you need to address that with, like we've said, you're a play therapist. Does it happen that you would have to like sort of explain that through play? I think out of 20 years. Okay. And that's a lot of kids. I'm not going to say thousands because I don't like to exaggerate. But one by one by one over 20 years, that's a lot of kids. Um, I think there are only two kids that their parents came into my practice 
for severe obesity. Um, there's one boy I worked with that uh, when slim fit pants came into style about five years ago, uh, he got very self-conscious. He was a little husky and he wanted slim fit pants and that did not go under well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I think that's it. But I would say most parents aren't targeting their kids per se about like, you have a problem, we need to talk about this. It's more the unspoken messages and just being a person in the world. I will, you know, sit out with neighbors, meet people at weddings, simchas, and I see the messaging. Don't take a second piece of cake. You already had da 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 da. Maybe if you're hungry, go eat the salad or. Right. Um, so a lot of messaging. And yes, we should tell our children not to eat half of the food on the simcha table. But do we have to tie it into weight or is it right. Derek Eretz, right? Right, like, right, right. We need to leave room for other people, you right. know? Right, Yeah, so, okay, so I, I hear that in your practice, it's not coming up so much um, directly, but you see it like more like indirectly. That indirectly. Like, and I yeah. think... I think I want to say that sometimes parents, like, unless it's overwhelming, right? Like, a, there's a difference between a kid being 10 pounds overweight or 50 pounds overweight. And, but I have seen just from life experience, how parents treat children who are a little more, you know, they have a little more pounds on them differently than the children that are thin. Right. And that is a setup for eating disorders. Like I've seen it it's those messages over and over and over again that that would, that the value of a human being is really in them being thin. Right. It's interesting also that you said that um, like your folk, you're, try, you're trying to teach the parents and the children like the focus isn't the way that you look. It's like so much more than that. Yeah. Is that something that you like that you could explain like how that would be something that you would play out and play or come up? That sure. Sure. So there are a few ways to do play therapy, right? So the non-directive play therapy doesn't have a child a parent in the playroom, it's the child. Child gets to choose whatever they want to play. In that play, let's say if they're playing in the kitchen center, I would say six and younger, kids really love playing in a nice kitchen center. And when I bring a parent into the room, which is I love working with family systems, it's you see the nourishment and the nurture, right? It's like, here, mommy, have a cookie. And one mother is going to go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and another mother is going to go, I think I'll have the broccoli. Mommy's right. on a diet, right? Right. right? So in that moment, it's a teaching moment, and I will use it. I'll say, well, we're not dieting here. We're just having a cookie. Right. Right? Yeah. Right? And you would so, you would call the parent in to see like how that would really play out at home, or you would just call the parent out to teach her or him? I think I don't call out parents in front of their children on a regular basis. So that would have to be a playful interweave, right? The parent wouldn't feel called out on. But I like to do parenting every few weeks with parents in my practice. And I would address it if it was something I saw that happened several times. Like how is that at home? Like, how, how do you actually talk about cookies? How do you talk about food? Mm -hmm. What is, right. what is diet culture like in your house? Right. And, and how would it, like, let's say, I don't know if you're thinking of someone specific or like in general, how would, how, how would a parent usually respond to that? Like type of, I think parents plan? are not defensive. I think parents are like, look, uh, this is my life. I'm constantly on a diet. And on my job, because the parent is not my client, I do work with parents as clients, but because they're not my client, my job is more in that point to do psychoeducation, which is to educate about how we would talk to children. And I understand a lot about intuitive eating. I've had my own struggle with eating. I, I wouldn't call it like a struggle struggle but just in managing and being okay with my body size, because I live in the same world everybody else lives, right? right? Right. And I'm clearly aware that I could have been thin, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
I really would just talk about the importance of not putting adult ways of thinking about food on children that even if they take a little piece of something and they say like, okay, I'm, I'm full, like right. enjoy, right. but like, I, I don't know if you saw that video I did with myself eating friend, a French fry um, where I was like with my grandson, my, my daughter doesn't want him in my videos. So, and I respect that. And I would be like, Hey, we're eating French fries. Mayor said, Bobby, let's have a French fry party. Do you know when the last time I ate French fries was? I mean, at close to 50, I got to worry about sugar, cholesterol, whatever. Not in a crazy way, but um, French fries are a treat, you know? Right, right. And again, I'm not, I'm not going, I know that you have a different way of looking at it, but but I'm not, I'm not overly going to eat French fries. Right. I hear Meaning, you. Like, so the fried food. So, and I, in general, actually don't love fried food. So um, I like pizza. So I'll eat pizza. Right. So I did a video literally of like, Hey, eating, eating French fries. I know we don't eat French fries all the time, but don't make it about yourself. Right. When your child wants a French fry, you only want one, go ahead, eat one. Right. If you want five, eat five. It's not going to kill you. Right. But what will kill you if I tell little May who just turned three, Bobby's on a diet. Right, right. What is right. a diet anyway? Right, right. right? Yes, I, I hear that. Yes, a lot. I mean, I see in my in my practice, it's it's like the people who are coming to me have who have been put on diets when they were... Yeah. As, yes. in, as young as five or, or parents calling me now and saying, you know, my child needs to lose weight. I don't do that. So I don't know. I'm still, get, I'm still having to do something with my branding or something that I'm still getting those phone calls, but I don't, I won't help with weight loss. That's not what I do, but yeah. But um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I'm just reminding myself of a teenager I worked with that developed prediabetes. She was overweight and she had other issues. Mm-hmm. And I said to the mother, I said, before you put her on a diet, I need you to talk, call the doctor and ask, because they were already talking about it. Right. Is this at the point where this girl must modify her food and go into an extreme way of eating? Or is it something that could be watched? Mm -hmm. Because I don't want an eating disorder to be developed. And since I'm not the doctor, I can't make that decision. Right. And she spoke to the doctor and they made a choice to take a step back, let her know that she needed to watch the sugar because that was what she needed to do, but it didn't mean all or nothing. Right. And it was her choice to go on a diet or to watch and go for blood work every couple of months to just make sure. And I, I was so proud of those parents because A, they took the feedback Right. They followed up and went to the doctor and see, they gave their child room. Autonomy. Autonomy to grow, right. to right. understand food, not to make it about dieting or not dieting. Right. Um, actually, it's funny that you mentioned the French fry with your grandson, because I was going to say that I, I saw, I think I saw that video, but I also saw you eating a donut on, on Hanukkah and I was so, I loved it because um I don't you probably aren't even aware of this but there is a hashtag I think it's women eating food or women enjoying food something like that oh no I'm not going, aware of that okay yeah that was going around for a while I think Alyssa Rumsey started it she's a dietitian who does intuitive eating also mm -hmm. and um it was a really cute hashtag where like you know women don't eat on the like we uh, women don't eat I'm just joking I'm being sarcastic but like for sure not on the camera you know like who wants to be and I'm saying myself included, like I'm, I would probably not, like, I would be self-conscious someone took a video of me eating, but, but, but why, why would I be self-conscious women eat, you know, men eat, women eat, we all eat and we all should enjoy our food. So like, okay. that was, that yeah. was like, yeah. I, I found that to be like, you didn't even realize that that was like, sort of like part of the hashtag, but like, I thought it was like, so nice for people to see, like women should enjoy a donut, just like right. everyone else should enjoy right. them, you know? So I'm actually getting really emotional. I have tears in my eyes because I run a WhatsApp group. People told me that Instagram is causing them to be addicted and they wanted my social media off Instagram. So I opened a WhatsApp group and I just actually today, I opened it to group feedback instead of admin because I got such horrific feedback 
because of that donut that I ate, people were like, we didn't sign up to watch you eat a donut for one minute. And mm-hmm. like, you are sounding so silly. <gasps> and 10 people left the WhatsApp group. And I, a professional reached out to me and said, she had good intentions. She's like, I don't know you. I refer to you all the time. All the people, I was so excited for you to open this WhatsApp group for my folks are not on, on Instagram. And and you sound so silly that people are just unimpressed and they wouldn't want to come to you. So I ha- I, I was on my way to Brooklyn for like a Shabbos Hanukkah get together and my heart was pounding. I mean, this is my livelihood. Right. You know? And I'm just trying to give back to the community. It takes time to create the content, to think about making a change. And when, and that donut was eaten because little mayor who had just gotten his pay has said, Bobby, welcome, let's have a donut. Right. So I hadn't eaten donuts the whole Hanukkah, not because I didn't want to, I did want to, again, my COVID issues with food. Right. And that donut was eaten, not because I wanted it. It was eaten because my grandson said, hey, Bobby, let's eat a donut. And whether I was in the mood or not, I didn't want to give him a message right, that right. mommies don't eat donuts. So I said the bracha, I opened the camera and I said, hey, we're going to eat a donut. And I proceeded to eat a whole donut. And the flack that I got for that video was insane. Offline, online people, I think on Instagram, people like seeing vulnerability. They like yeah. seeing a different flavor. Right. And just yesterday, someone p- messaged me and said, by the way, that video that you took about the donut, it was so instructional because my parents, I learned from you eating that donut what to do with my children, exactly what the point was. But people have lots of feelings about things. And so when you put yourself out there, you don't expect, like I I didn't expect this kind of pushback. So I'm glad you're bringing it up because it's so important for people listening that Mm -hmm. this is actually a real thing that happened. Okay. Wow. I'm so happy that I brought that up because um because I wasn't sure what you were gonna say when you said that yeah. you're emotional, but I, yeah. I watched that video and I thought, wow, good for her, you know? Like and it's interesting to hear it's interesting, I think it's interesting for people to hear the backstory as well that whether you were hungry or not or in the mood of a donor. No, I wasn't or not, hungry and I wasn't in the mood. It was just the you know, I wanna show my ch- my grandson that donuts are not scary, they're not a big deal. And I think that maybe the people who reacted to that just don't understand how, I know that for me, um, like some of my friends, they see my content and they're like, are people really afraid of a donut? I'm like, um, hello, <laughs> this is my job. <laughs> like they can't right. relate to it. Right. So they think right. it sounds a little extreme or crazy, but exactly what you just said about somebody else, that that content landing on someone else and who really got the point was like, wow, I really, that gave me such, such, in, so many instructions for how to, handle that with my kid I I think that that's you can't it's so hard not to take it personally right and it was Uh, a playful moment this is all about playful parenting or playful grandparenting right food plays a big part in our life as from people and in every culture actually right you know yeah um that's really interesting I have to I I want to like process that whole story because I was just saying it like off the cuff you know yeah um But anyways, we, I, we do have to wrap up this um, episode, but it was so nice to like get to know you and hear all the things that you're doing. And for sure, let's hear where, where could people find you? Sure. So I'm Parenting with Gelly anywhere on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, Gelly Asafsky on LinkedIn, um, parentingwithgelly.com. Anywhere you want to find me online, if you're offline, you want to find out about the course. You can, um, you can, I'll give the number, I'll, I'll just say it, but you can put it under yeah. the show notes, 92999CHILD, okay. 92999CHILD, and there's a 17 minute intro to the course. Online, um, if you'd like information, you can reach out to me 
I'm, I'm working, the only difference, because I know this is mostly a from audience, so I'll just say I usually like to tell people to go into one place, but depending on your style of learning, it's both the same content, one is more leaning to yeshivish, haimish, chasidish, because as I built this, and we did our fourth round already, people asked for more Torah values to be put into that. And mm -hmm. so online, it's the same hashkafa, but since it's open to anybody, I'll say God instead of Hashem. And I also, there's the option of building community. Mm -hmm. So it's more pricey because I'm there. I'm in the Facebook group every day. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more interaction but the support is way bigger. So, so you're gonna, you could pick whatever, if you want more support, yeah, less support, yeah, if you want yeah. more Hashkafa, more Torah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's so cool. I love that you're so open to the feedback from your, yeah. from your, you know, followers. And yeah, you're doing amazing work. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. And great meeting you. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Cause you help me, I guess, I always say the 80, 20 rule. Like that's, that's the way, cause I'm not a dietitian. I'm like, don't make your kids crazy. If they're eating fine, 80% of the time, look away, kid eats cookies, they eat super snacks, ice cream. It's fine. It's food. Life is about mm -hmm. celebration. Right. It's right. not about like, you know, right. Right. So, yeah. um, um, this is something that I, I think you're doing important work and getting that message out there is really important. Oh, it was so nice to talk with you. You too. Thank you so much. This was so nice. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.